so we're still in Florida. It's May 2020. <clears throat> we're still laying low. And I suppose just like everybody else, we're getting kind of anxious to be on the move again. And uh, going through some of our videos, things that we haven't um, posted at all yet. And while looking at some of our videos, um, makes us really appreciate the lifestyle that we have. So, you know, you can go on vacation and we've done a lot of the, the things that are like destinations. We've done Mount Rushmore. We've done Yellowstone Park. We've been to Washington, D.C. Saw a lot of awesome museums. We've been to several presidential museums. We like museums. Heck, we've even been to Wild Drug Store. Now that is a classic. But one cool thing about traveling the way that we travel is that you run across some of the most unusual kind of quirky little places, museums and places that it's kind of like one of those, well, who would have thunk? I mean, who would think of even making a museum about potatoes? Who would have thought we'd find a tiny little museum, very tiny, that was so full of the history of computers and robotics? Who would have thought of even making a museum just about skeletons, you know? So that is one of the fun things about traveling the way we do, is just finding all the unusual, quirky, who would have thunk sort of things. So if any of you have been to some kind of quirky, eclectic, unusual places like museums or um, towns, let us know. Leave a comment below. I think I'm going to start a map and just put a pin on all the different little things that we hear about. And then if we happen to be in the area, we'll definitely have to check them out. So, let's check out some of these little gems that we found. God, I'm not used to that. <laughs> Shut the car up. Okay, we are now in Bozeman, Montana. And we are on the search for more offbeat, quirky things to do and see. Today we've actually found the American Computer and Robotics Museum. Um, we believe it's somewhere by the, by the university. Yeah, that's like Bozeman State University. All right, so we're here in Bozeman, Montana, and I didn't know we were gonna do this, so I didn't put on any makeup, but I thought, what the heck, we're in Montana, I'm going all natural. <sighs> you know what? I think she's beautiful, just the way she is. <laughs> That's why she's wearing her glasses. Okay, we're at the American Computer and Robotics Museum. I'm so excited because I'm a ex-mechanical engineer. I can hardly contain my water. So let's go inside and take a look. Our visit started with a brief guided tour that was really interesting, gave us the highlights plus a few extra facts. And I love this poster with Einstein, wisdom is not a product of schooling but is a lifelong attempt to acquire it. In my classroom I actually had another quote by Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge. A lot to see here, it all kind of starts from the uh, Babylonian brick that actually shows man is writing. That's where it starts. And here's what I love, the Gutenberg. This is when literacy really took off because books were available to everybody, not just the, the rich, the royalty, and the church. This is such a small museum, but inch for inch, it's probably the best museum for showing the, the whole history from per, the first personal computers to artificial intelligence, space race, cracking the Enigma code, and so much more. We've got a, a photograph of the ENIAC electronic numerical integrator and computer. Took up a whole room. This guy's job, actually, we were told, is uh, replacing tubes all day. Yikes. 
So eventually this whole room of tubes was put on that one chip. So this truly is where it all changed. And here they said this big ENIAC could process certain thing in two years, one month, and three weeks, calculate a problem. That same problem could be done in about two minutes on the microprocessor. Wow, got the first microprocessor in 1971 in my lifetime. Wow, the changes that have happened. This part I love, this is where the personal computer took off. And a lot of it happened in garages and basements. And here's the Apple I computer, 1976, donated by Waz. So just to show how much advance has taken place, the Selectron apparently was a memory tube and it cost $4,700 each. And this is in 2008 dollars, a $40, 256 gig memory uh, stick. So if you take eight billion, excuse me, eight billion of this tube, that equals this. So eight billion of this costs 37.5 trillion dollars, and that now equals a $40 memory stick. And this is only the beginning of this little museum. Wow. There is so much to see. It could take a long video to do that, but we won't go there. So anyways, it definitely is a museum to see if you're into computers and robotics. They've got things from the Enigma machine, NASA, women in computing, gaming, artificial intelligence, and just so much more. So uh, when we record and save our videos on our channel, we have a little storage box like this, and ours is two terabytes. This one is only one terabyte. And the sign basically says in the beginning, the hard disk drive in 1965 when it was invented was this giant. It was only eight megabytes. So this one terabyte box, you'd have to have 125,000 of these platters spinning away to have that. And we have two terabytes at home. So we have 250,000 of these babies spinning away at home. I mean, yeah, we wouldn't have room in the RV I for know. that. I've only got 45 more minutes, so I'm going to have to step it up, Sue. So I got stuck in the Enigma machine display, uh, the German code breaking machine. Unbelievable story. I'm a nerd. <laughs> I love nerds. With all these code machines going on with war, I still find it interesting <clears throat> that the more successful code was by using the Native American language. People again prevail. And this is something I've always wondered. This is something to think about. 30 things replaced by smartphones. Wow. So who would have thought a little rinky-dink museum built into the side of like a really nice strip mall building would be as interesting as it was? And I realized the uh, subject matter was, you know, very narrow, you know, computer and robotics. But my God, it just covered the history from, you know, way back when Vietnam and all the important and earth-shaking and death-defying things that happened, you know, with wars and going to the moon and, uh, you know, how it's affected our jobs and our lives and our health. Just amazing. You know.
I really like to. Is it worth it? How about you, Sue? Let me grab the camera. Yeah. My thoughts on this place was amazing from the beginning of just writing language down to going to the moon and artificial intelligence, which kind of freaks me out a little bit. It was really cool to see all the women that were involved in um, computer programming and just everything that brought us to where we are today. Mm -hmm. So well worth it. Kind of off the beaten path, but Bozeman, Montana, if you go there, you got to see this. It's really fascinating. How much did it cost to get in? It's free. All donations. So donate well. Okay, so he actually told us donations are their main thing to support it. So it's well worth it. Check it out. And now we're in Oklahoma City at the Museum of Osteology. It's all about bones and it has over 300 skeletons that come from all over the world. Some as, as tiny as mice and to a 40-foot humpback whale. This all began in 1972 when J. Marate, I think that's how you say it, was only seven. He found a dog skull in the woods and was fascinated by it. His father encouraged him to find and collect other skulls. So Jay began cleaning and selling skulls in his spare time. And you may wonder who would want them. Well, there's universities, colleges, just to name a couple. So as sales grew, Jay turned his hobby into a business. In 1990, Jay opened Skulls Unlimited and earned a worldwide reputation for having the best quality, most professional service and the largest variety of natural bone and replica osteological specimens. But then by 2010, Jay completed construction of this, the Skeletons Museum of Osteology, and he built it right next to his processing facility. One of the things I found fascinating was how they actually cleaned the bones with no damage from harsh chemicals. They actually used beetles which picked the cadaver clean. There's so much more to learn and see at this museum. Definitely check it out. Well, we're now in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Idaho? What the hell is Idaho? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are now in Idaho Falls. So we left Salt Lake, and when you're in Salt Lake, what do you do? You see the Salt Lake. When you're in Idaho Falls, what do you do? You see the falls. Added bonus, though, being in Idaho, you actually get to see the Potato Museum. And that is where we're headed right now. Idaho Potato Museum is actually about 25 miles south of Idaho Falls. We've seen a lot of fields here, I assume. They're potato fields. Take the first left. Wow, how does this thing work? Yep. Wow. So all the magic starts right here. This is the PTO power takeoff that makes everything turn in here. And apparently this scoop down in the bottom here just scoops off the top layer of the dirt and the plant and snags it into this chute. And this conveyor is going all the way up. And you'll notice how porous the conveyor is. All of the dirt and everything can fall off down into here, you know. So then it looks like the potatoes fall off that roller onto this belt. All the debris falls down in here. Plants and sticks and everything grab, grab by this and yanked out and stripped up here and fall out. The potatoes and everything falls into here. Debris can still fall down through the belt here. The potatoes here are rolling and rolling. And they're talking amongst themselves like, you think I'll get to go to McDonald's? Okay, and they're going this way, and then eventually they fall down here. Debris can still fall out. The potatoes go this way. They go out that conveyor, don't fall over this one. And there's a truck here. And all the potatoes are going in.
There you have it from the mechanical engineer. Wow, now that's a potato. This is where we will be going, to the Potato Station Cafe, but first to the museum. Let's check the potato out. Let's go, Mark. I'm excited. Look at that guy. He's a man, honey. He goes visits potato museums with his rig and his toad. Wow. We have to get a campground, park, pay the money, take our toad <laughs> off, and drive here. And that's why I don't have a man. Oh. Here we go. So we're now at the Potato Museum. Little bonus going on here. You got this awesome bag, but inside it, ooh, Idaho spuds. Mark is salivating, knowing he gets to have this tonight. <laughs> Let's explore. It actually was originally a train depot, and once it was put out of commission, the city got it and turned it into their Idaho Potato Museum. So you know that's a question I always had, why Idaho for potatoes? And they've got just the right climate, short summers with hot days, cool nights. The soil is good, it's volcanic soil. You saw a lot of these irrigation honey, so apparently it doesn't rain enough and they've solved that by just having those gadgets that swivel around and suck some of that eastern Snake River uh, The Snake aquifer. River is all over with their aquifer. So that is why Idaho, it's got all the right things for the potato to grow. So this is cool. I'm looking at all these potatoes and it reminds me of when I was in Peru and we have potatoes all the time, all kinds. And sure enough, here we go. The Peru farmers preserve their culture and continued to grow potatoes. It's an interesting little story about the potato god. These are actually vessels that were similar to what was used by um, certain tribes. Good tribe and bad tribe. Good tribe had been pushed out of their area because of volcanic action and into the bad tribe who enslaved them. And the potato god came to them and said, plant the seeds, eat the roots, and give the greens to the to the bad tribe, which is actually poisonous. And then they were set free. And just like most museums, there's memorabilia and artifacts. Who would have thought? Driving here, Mark made the comment about Dan Quayle misspelling potatoes, and he said, I'll bet you anything they'll have something about him. Sure enough, there it is. So he was at a spelling bee, and he corrected the young speller because they did not put an E at the end, which actually was incorrect. So the kid actually had it right. So that was the big joke. And they have a potato actually signed by Dan Quayle. So if you didn't own one of those kits that Sue just showed, or at least if you didn't know what it is, then you shouldn't be watching this video and your parents should be banning you from it. So besides all the memorabilia, there's a lot of educational things and history about the potato. One of my childhood memories across the street from where I lived, they had a field they'd cycle in different crops and sometimes it'd be potato. And I can remember not necessarily the digger, but after the digger went through, we would go over, my brothers, sisters, neighborhood kids would go over with shovels and we'd dig up whatever the digger missed. And we'd end up with some, sometimes these huge bags of potatoes left behind. Fun memory. How many of these different styles do you remember? 
I actually remember using about two or three of them. Looks like Mark found the Potato Cafe already. Mm. Wow, look at all that. And now it's time to hit the buffet. Um, cheese, bacon, do the onions, the scallions. Excellent. Woo. So, so how many people take video of their potato when they're ordering it? My God, Sue, you invaded the potato. This is what you do at the Potato Museum. Yum. Mm. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we got Rocky Road ice cream. And he says it's made with cream, but they put potato flakes in it, and it's supposed to be a lot creamier. So, Rocky Road. What do you think, Mark? I think it's pretty good. It's a great gimmick for this place. Take some ice cream, sprinkle a little bit of um, Aunt Jemima potato flakes, <laughs> stir it up, and now you can say it's potato ice cream. Aunt Jemima. <laughs> Potato flakes of some sort, potato splits. Okay, so we're wrapping it up here at the Idaho Potato Museum, and we decided to go back and have some huckleberry potato ice cream mm. this time. Looking good. And if you like this video, give us a thumbs up. And consider subscribing to help us achieve our goal of one million subscribers. Marco, please. Okay. Help us achieve our goal of 100,000 subscribers. Marco, please. Okay, come on. Don't make me beg. 300. That's 300 good. subscribers. Help us out. Leave some comments below. Let us know what you think. Okay, thanks for coming along. You know, we don't need ice cream that often. So when we do, it's really good, really good.